You are listening to episode number 59 of the Animals at Home podcast. Welcome to this week's episode of the Animals at Home podcast. If you're new here, my name is Dylan Perrin and welcome. This is the podcast that inspires others to push the limits of their animal husbandry by promoting the importance of high level creative care individualized for each animal. As a reminder, the podcast has a new website, animalsathomenetwork.com. You can find all the information about the show there. There is a header at the top that says Animals at Home Podcast. You can click on that, find all the other episodes. You can subscribe to it from iTunes or Spotify, Stitcher or Google Podcasts from there. You can donate to the show if you'd like, or you can buy a shirt or sweater. And of course, $5 for every clothing item does get donated to the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy. And as always, one of the best ways you can support the show is by going to the Apple Podcasting app and giving the show a five-star rating. I always appreciate that. Thank you very much to our show's sponsor, CustomReptileHabitats.com. If you are looking for any gold standard reptile keeping equipment, definitely check them out. There are always affiliate links in the show notes as well as the YouTube description. Joining me on the podcast today is Pete Hawkins. Pete is a longtime reptile keeper and a very prolific article and blog post writer. He's written for many outlets, including Practical Reptile Keeping Magazine, Exotic Direct, Northampton Reptile Center, and many more. He's also the founder of the very popular network Facebook groups that you may have seen. There's Chameleon Network, Bearded Dragon Network, Snake Network, Lizard Network, Tortoise Network, and Amphibian Network. And he's also compiled almost all of his writing onto his own website, reptilenetworks.co.uk. I really enjoyed this conversation with Pete. He's just a very down-to-earth keeper who is always interested in learning and advancing his care. In this episode, we talk about how he manages his Facebook groups to make sure they remain successful and don't devolve into the classic Facebook arguing match. We chat about his current collection as well as how he's gone bioactive with his Brazilian rainbow boa, which for me is highly interesting because it's something that I want to do with my own. And we break down a few of his articles, including one where he has tested some UVB bulbs and tested them over a year and monitored how they have generated over the full year. We talked about vitamin D supplementation or the lack thereof. And we also talked about feeders and how to use a variety of feeders. And Pete has this incredible list of feeder insects that he uses for his animals. So it was really cool to hear that. And it's definitely inspired me to try and be way more experimental with the feeder insects that I use. All right. With all of that being said, let's jump into the episode. Enjoy. All right. Well, Pete, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for being here. Thanks for having me, my friend. You're kind of like a mysterious guy online (laughs) because you're everywhere, but at the same time, you're sort of behind the scenes in a lot of ways. You have lots of writing. You're a part of all these different Facebook groups, and I always see you know articles in magazines and whatnot. But at the same time, you're you're not you don't have a like a huge Instagram account where you have you you know your face all over the place and everything. Is that kind of by design? Do you like sort of being a little step back from being in the Uh, forefront of it? Um, I guess so. I mean, I've never really been bothered about the Instagram and the YouTube sort of thing. I mean, it's it's a great source of um, any information nowadays for most channels. I mean, like yourself with the YouTube, it's pretty cool. Um, but it's just something I've never been able to, to devote a ton of time to, um, mm-hmm. especially with my Facebook groups and all my writing and stuff I do. It just takes up 99% of the time. I just haven't got time to mess around with instagram and uh youtube anyway oh yeah no i hear you you or instagram for me is an absolute chore and <laughs> i i try to be consistent with it but it's just it's tough so anyway let's uh, rewind the clock a little bit and go back to how did you find yourself in in the reptile industry reptile trade um i thought my first reptile was a bearded dragon and it was about 1989 88 89 i think it was um i was only a young lad about 11 12 years old and it was a local pet shop uh that was way before the likes of all these big chain stores it was just a local little pet shop sold puppies cats a few birds and they had this uh like a mini dinosaur is what i used to call <laughs> it and uh we got quite friendly with the owner and he uh entrusted it onto me uh, and that's how it all started and then i went to garter snakes and it just progressed from there but i mean looking back at the care for that bearded dragon it was a uh, you can imagine it was a uh, pretty awful and surprise it lived as long as it did to be fair yeah i think when we all think about those first few reptiles we go oh my gosh i can't believe <laughs> that's what i did with them <laughs> did i mean did yeah, you uh, yeah sorry. did did your did it snowball quite quickly or did you have the bearded dragon for a while before you jumped into other animals 
Yeah, I mean, I I know it was a fully grown bearded dragon, from what I remember. Um, I had it for about two or three years, which, as I said, thinking about the setup now, I'm so and the diet especially. Oh my god! Um, but uh, then after that passed away, I pretty much went straight onto garter snakes, and then within that year. I did get another bearded dragon and it's just, I've had bearded dragons in my life pretty much for the last 30 years, so, as well as other things. But yeah, it progressed. It snowballed. Mm-hmm. So in terms of the care, obviously, as you're saying, you know, you start with the very basic and, and typically horrible care as we all do when we first jump into the hobby. That's the one yeah. cool thing about reptiles is they're so resilient. They just kind of wait around until we smarten up a little bit. How how has did your philosophy changed? Was it a slowly gradual process? Because obviously now, and we're, I want to jump into all your, your care and everything. If you go onto your Instagram page, the the setups you have are really amazing. So how did you get from where you started to where you are now in terms of just the philosophy? Um, well, back in the day, like I said, there was no internet. Um, mm-hmm. It was all reading books, and some of these books were like written in the seventies and sixties, um, and you took whatever the pet shop owner or your vet, you took what they told you as gospel. That's what you did. Um, And basically, internet has saved the day, really. It's uh, for information. It's it's just at your fingertips. But basically, internet. And we used to go on these various meetings as well, like um, reptile meetings. Uh, They used to be organized in the papers, local newspapers. And we used to travel around the country and meet other breeders and exchange bugs and that's how i used to do it back in the day so i'm guessing it's just the internet has saved us all really yeah no it definitely opened up yeah it's it's so funny to think about how almost isolated you are you know go back (laughs) 15 years ago isolated without the internet you just have the animal and you really just rely on what you heard from the pet store and and I, i was i was talking to john courtney smith last week and i was kind of comparing that to almost you know, if someone went to the pet store and bought a goldfish and they put it yep. in a bowl and you wouldn't really consider them to be part of the aquarium hobby because they're that they have the animal, Familiar, but they just they're, they're not doing anything with it. Yeah, and, exactly, and there's a yeah. lot of people like that in their reptile hobby. And that's kind of how we all start as well. Like you have this animal, but you're not really part of the hobby until you start sinking your teeth into, you know, much further development. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, with the Internet being so precious to us all, it's also like a double edged sword because, as you know, there is some awful information out there and Mm -hmm. it's just you need the guidance into something you know to follow someone good rather than the dog crap that you see there is a lot of that crap so oh my gosh so you need the guidance you need to pick a group or a forum and follow the guidance of someone who you think knows what they're doing anyway and hopefully they can guide you Yes, that is definitely the challenge is everybody is a, a genius on, on Facebook and whatnot, and it can be hard to sort through the, the wheat from the chaff. And exactly. so is, is that where these, the idea for your Facebook, maybe you could just give an outline of your Facebook groups and, and kind of what they are and, and how you started them. Um, well, oh, I was admin in a couple of other groups going back five, six, seven years ago on Facebook. Um, uh, that was great. I mean, they're, they're great people, still are nice people. Um, but I didn't like the way that they weren't progressing with their care. They weren't following the technology, which we what we all should do, should embrace it because it makes the care better. Um, so I kind of had enough. And uh, I thought to myself, I'll start my own bearded dragon group. And that's where it all started. And everybody was saying, you're not going to do it because there's so many groups around. And that was like four years late ago, well, four years ago. And I've got, I think, 29,000 members in it, I think. so Nice size worked. group. <laughs> so it's worked, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and from the Bearded Dragon group, I started a chameleon group, um, which is Chameleon Network. Uh, so I've got Bearded Dragon Network, Chameleon Network, Snake Network, Lizard Network, Gecko Network, Tortoise Network. Um, what else have I got? I've got inverts and spider network and I've got a gaming network for the gamers out there. That's awesome. Yeah. So (laughs) you really do cover almost, and you kind of cover the whole span of the hobby in terms of the the Facebook groups and each group has, I think the bearded dragon one is maybe the biggest, but the rest have at least a few thousand. Yeah. Um, I think the second biggest is the chameleon one. I think that's like eight 
thousand, I think, and then the snake network is yeah, four or five thousand. Uh, but whatever, I've never I've never been in it for the numbers. It's just mm-hmm. uh, getting the information out there. So, and I've got a lot of good admin and mods with me, so they they do help. I couldn't do it without them, honestly. Yeah, well, that that's the thing. You can't just start a Facebook group and then just sit back and let it evolve on its own because exactly. it just turns into a dumpster fire. <laughs> so, are are you doing anything specific? I mean, how much work do you have to put in every you know every week to manage these groups, or do you have it mostly allocated to other people? Um, no, as I said, they are a great help, but um, I'm lucky with my job. I mean, I work security, so that is my main job, and I get a lot of time to browse on my phone. Uh, write articles and whatnot so i can cover it i I can manage just about but answering the private messages on facebook is is another matter i must get about 20 30 a day honestly and i just i do get to them eventually but it just takes me so long that's insane (laughs) yeah it is the private, like I get quite a few private messages as well. And I, I don't mind them. I, I get emails as well, but yeah. I, I don't get anywhere near that number. And I think it's uh, because I don't paint myself as a care expert, but you kind of have. So I imagine that uh, everybody just draws to you. I mean, uh, I don't consider myself an expert. I'm just an enthusiast like most people. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I shouldn't say you painted it. yourself that way. It's more, it's more you're sharing your knowledge. So people just are yeah. drawn towards people sharing I mean, knowledge. It's, uh, we're all all of us are always learning so that's otherwise it will get pretty boring pretty quick so yeah that's that's the good thing um and if someone wants to talk to me and ask me questions i have no issues with uh giving them my advice if they want to take it it's up to them if i mean yeah i do what i can yeah there is this funny thing in the reptile industry where there is a group of people who assume that they now know everything there is to know about caring for that specific animal they're just like i'm done like there's definitely no more information here (laughs) and the arrogance in that mindset is is something that's hard to explain yeah uh there is so many of those sort of people it's it's just impossible to know everything it's like uh when people say they took what their vet said as verbatim that's what they do i mean vets they study to cure the animal, to diagnose. Some of them know the vet, uh, they know the husbandry. Not all of them. I mean, that's down to them to um, research that. I mean, my vet is great. She, mm-hmm. she knows everything. Um, uh, but, you know, it's always worth going onto these groups and asking advice just to back it up. Don't always go with just one person. Ask a few people. Yeah, exactly. Do you guys have specific rules that you kind of copy and paste for each group that that work well to maintain the group from going, you know, awry or hitting the ditch? <laughs> there's always a few that ruin it all, my friend. There's always a few. Um, <laughs> but you, you can't, with such a large group, you can't help having a few um, idiots ruin it all for everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, but the main thing, we just try and be nice. It's, um, even if someone's being a bit aggressive, you find that nice always wins them over. So just be nice uh provide them with the links provide them with your research just be nice that's that's the main thing yeah just being polite is exactly is huge. <laughs> yeah i know i just i've said it so many times on the podcast but i always just laugh at the way people behave online is so unlike you would behave if you were face to face like how crazy it would be if you saw someone behave that way face to face like you would call them a psychopath be, <laughs> you know like if someone was just like hey you're stupid you're an idiot like this is what like it, it is but there's something about the online communication that allows us to do that without feeling actually you wrote a, a good article kind of about you know keyboard warriors and, and yeah i mean i've had it all in the past i mean i've got groups now that absolutely despise me and i've never even spoken to any of the admin it's the admin that don't like me uh, in these groups. So weird. Not, I know. I don't understand. I've never spoken to any of them. They've just, I don't know. I don't know what it is, but my, like a few people said it's jealousy, but whatever. It's down to them. They're wasting yeah. their energy. So, Yeah. And, and people do really, as we were saying before, they hold on to these old myths, you know, something like, you know, substrate myths, you know, impaction. Yeah. We, I mean, we've, there's been a lot of activity in the last few weeks about that with Joseph and Liam posting some awesome videos on that. Yeah. And, and, but that sort of thing, people hold so tightly they never want to let go that loose substrate causes impaction and it becomes like an ideology so if anyone disagrees with them it's just the only thing that left to do is attack them until they go away that's a lot of it there's it's just uh disagreements people's um 
opinions. I mean, like I always say, you can have your own opinions, but you can't have your own facts. Mm -hmm. um, that's what these people are, seem to have their own facts. And yeah, it's just all exactly. Nonsense. So as far as your current collection goes, what, what are you keeping right now? Um, I have got, what have I got? I've got a female Val Chameleon. Um, I've got a Russian Tortoise. Uh, Brazilian Rainbow Boa, Corn Snake, Royal Python. I've got a couple of Toke Gecko, uh, a couple of Crested Gecko, a Leopard Gecko, a Hognose Snake, uh, Red Eye Tree Frog. Uh, I think that's it, I think. So that is a good size collection, and especially because you have these incredible enclosures and it a lot they're all naturalistic i don't know if they're all bioactive but you've done a, a really good job on all of them yeah they are yeah all of them so how, how are you managing a collection that size while maintaining such high care um it used to be bigger so I've, i have had to um move a few on just mm -hmm. to to cope i don't know how these people do it with like 30 40 reptiles and full-time yeah, jobs but fair play to them but i just couldn't do it um it's just uh I mean, luckily with the bioactive setups, a lot of the stuff is done on its own. But I mean, I do spot check for any poop daily because if I see it, I do pick it up. You can't leave it to the cleanup crew. They're not going to get rid of it all, no matter yeah. how much you've got. So um, it's just day. It literally takes probably 45 minutes, an hour to go around. And I've got automatic watering systems. Um, so that helps a lot with like the chameleons and the geckos and the frogs. Uh, so yeah, it's just feeding every few days as required. So literally 45 minutes, an hour probably of the day. Yeah. It's not that bad really. Yeah. And I mean, as long as you enjoy it, then it doesn't feel love like it. you're working. I absolutely love it. <laughs> so as far as your, so if you were to get a brand new animal, what is the process you go through in designing the enclosure and creating the environment? Um, I mean, my motto on the um, groups is uh, replicate, uh, replicate, emulate, stimulate. And that's what I try and do. I try and replicate the uh, natural living conditions. So that'll be like the substrate, the soils, um, the trees. So I'll get some logs and stuff. And an emulate would be their environmental conditions to try and like replicate the UVB that they uh, that they have. They're exposed to their temperatures. And obviously, stimulate is providing stimulation within the setup with logs and hunting for bugs uh so that's mental and physical stimulation um so i basically research where they come from that's where you just got to start you got to start from the basics and get and temperature go readings uv readings yep and then just yep. go from there and speak to other long-term keepers and just gather your information yeah yeah no it's so true it just it's Basic, the basic fact of starting from the location is really the easiest place. Yep. And, and now, like we are saying before, with the internet, it's amazing how many photos you can find of animals in their native environment. And it becomes, yeah, exactly. kind of becomes a fun game of, of trying to replicate that. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, it's the best, one of the best parts is researching for a new animal. I love doing that. Yeah. It's one of the, my favorite things. Um, yeah. But you'll still and, get and these people. It. Exactly. Yeah. And you'll still get these people that, when you say you got to bring part of their environment into a five foot box or whatever, you'll still think, still get these people saying, well, you don't want to bring parasites in. And you think, ah, oh, yeah, it's, it's not <laughs> worth my time. That's not yeah. what you mean, is it? You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. I was, I think I was, I think this is a conversation I had last week with John. I'm trying to remember now because I, I, I get that critique all the time as well. It's like, oh, you're trying to replicate <laughs> nature. It's like, where's the predator? Where's the, yeah. you know, the, the starvation? Oh, and uh, yeah, we're not quite going that far, but the point yeah. is, is we want them to, because it's so much more exciting when you get them there and you put them in that environment. And so as far as I wanted to, to linger on your Brazilian rainbow boa for a while, because I yep. have one as well and I, I don't have a bioactive. I think yours is, and I, yeah. I would love to, to do that. So tell me about that setup. Tell me about the, well, maybe we'll start with the substrate. Um, that is basically a sand Play sand and mostly topsoil mix. I have got a little bit of uh, bark mixed in as well, but I've, I use a lot of moss, um, carpet moss and cushion moss. Uh, cushion moss is great. That grows like crazy in my setups. Um, so for that, like when I spray the setups like daily, I will literally just spray the moss and that's it. I've never had any trouble with sheds, uh, but I use a lot of logs. Um, that's that's mainly it yeah so use a lot of moss 
Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I should look into that because so when you mist it down, are you kind of you're sort of focusing on the on the moss and then do you kind of give yeah. the whole thing a mist? Are you misting no, no, it no, every no. day? I just, I just uh I've got a lot of moss like in in the warm end. So I'm guessing mm. that keeps the humidity up as well. I don't really read the humidity so much. I mean, because I've not really had any issues. If I started having issues, I would use uh, so you know, get some humidity readings, but it, it, it seems all fine in there. So yeah, I basically just spray down the moss, give it a good old spray every day and that, that works for me sometimes i might you know go over the logs a bit but mainly the moss yeah because it's the, with the brazilian rainbow ball obviously we need to have high humidity but you also yeah. don't want it to be wet everywhere so i always wonder exactly. how people achieve that in that bioactive because it's so easy to make things overly wet when you're dealing with live animal or live plants yeah um yeah i've only got a couple of live plants in there um i can't remember what they were one's apophis uh um, what's the other one? Devil's Ivy, I think it's called the other one. Um, yeah, I think that's what it is. Um, but yeah, literally, I've got the moss near the warm end, and I've got like a, a water bowl in the cool end. I mean, it's just use moss. That's it. That that will win. Yeah, yeah. Interesting, interesting. And d- does the does the board crush the plants at all? Like, is is he or she hard on on the plants? He, he was, yeah. Uh, and that's why I took, uh, it, it wasn't working at first. So now I've decided to keep them in the pots rather than plant mm. them in the soil. Um, that definitely helps. It keeps it a bit, a bit more sturdy. Um, I, don't know if yeah. I, can, I don't know if I can walk it over and show you. Oh yeah, sure. Go for uh, it. I don't know if it all, uh, uh, I don't know. If, can you see much in there? Oh yeah. You, so you have a lot of plants in there. That looks awesome. There's three plants and I've got, like I said, some moss. You can see it growing down here. Um, yeah. I have no idea where he is. He's probably at the back somewhere underneath the logs. So I use quite a lot of birch, um, which I collect myself. I go out there and collect it all myself. Um, yeah, that's birch, what I do as well. Birch, oaks, and stuff like that. Yeah, but, people are always asking about in terms of how to sterilize wood or clean the wood. And you know, it's mm-hmm. it's not a huge deal. It's it's As long right. as you're... I mean, I usually put it in the oven or, or, or bake it or just rinse it off and clean off the yeah i don't even do the oven thing i just uh hose down in a hot shower uh i I mean sometimes i'll leave it soaking um that would drown anything that's in there but i've never had any troubles and i've been doing that for 30 years yeah so i've never had any related issues with parasites or anything like that so it's yeah it's a lot better than going to pay 40 dollars for a stick from the pet store (laughs) exactly (laughs) And in terms of the, the cleanup crew in in the boa's cage, what what are you using? Is it mostly isopods and springtails? It is, yeah, exactly. Um, I've got a few like um, darkling beetles in there, which I've just chucked some morio worms or super worms for you guys. I've chucked yeah. some of them in there, um, and that's about it. I have a few uh, some beetles wandering around in there, but they soon die off because there's no fruit in there. But um, right. that's that's about it. Yeah, just mainly the isopods and the springtails. And then for lighting and heating uh yep i've got a 12 percent arcadia uvb and i've also got uh the, what's it called the led bar arcadia led bar in there for the plants okay so, yeah that's a do you find that he's he comes out at the day in during the day at all or is he fairly nocturnal i find mine is fairly nocturnal um uh, no he'll come out uh pretty much as soon as the lights come on i've got, got, got the lights and the heat on a 12 hour cycle um mm. i don't have any heat at night I don't for any of my animals. Um, And he comes out early morning as a bask underneath the um, deep heat projector, uh, sometimes over the UV, and then he'll disappear in the logs, but he's still getting exposure because you can see his little head sticking out and all that sort of stuff. So mainly in the morning and early evening, he'll come out. What are you using for hides? I saw you had one half, uh, sort of half log there for a hide. And then do you have another? Yeah, he's a bit too big for that now. Um, for hides, really, just like I said, he just uses the logs. Just um, goes underneath a lot of pri- Yeah, he's got a, a few big, thick logs at the back. So he's got a lot of privacy there. And he just goes underneath uh, underneath the logs and the sticks and the branches. Yeah, that's one of the interesting things. Now that I'm thinking about it, I think we always get stuck, especially as if you're keeping snakes, you get stuck in needing like the two you know, specific hides. But you can do a lot with yeah. decor and, and make a more naturalistic you hide can. where it's going to act the exact same as your PVC little box, but it exactly. looks better and it gives them more stimulation too because they have to sort of wedge themselves under things and yeah. it might be kind of a pain in the ass to get them out. <laughs> it, it is a pain in the ass, but I mean, yeah. if you're dangling a mouse in there or a rat, they soon come out. <laughs> um, yes, exactly. But 
I mean, if you've got logs and branches running the length of the enclosure, uh, that's a lot of options for the snake to hide and stuff. So it's far better than just having a hide, as you said, in the hot end and the cool end. It's that's those days are gone. I think for that. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. And it th- that just leaves them with too limited of an option. It's exactly, like you're either yeah. cold or too hot, and they're basically. not going to hang out in the middle because they've got nothing there on these really basic setups that you get. So. Yeah, exactly. So you've done a lot of writing. You have articles all over the place, and then we'll kind of yeah. point people towards those. Uh, at, at the end of the show so they can go read them because you've done some fantastic stuff. How did you start? How did you get into the writing in the first place? Um, that was just through word of mouth. I mean, I've been pretty lucky, really. Um, people have contacted me. Um, uh, so I have been lucky. I can't even remember where it all started, um, to be honest. I think it was probably doing stuff for reptile apartment a few years back was the, the what mainly kicked it all off um and that's kind of gone on a hiatus at the moment um and then got contacted by the likes of canadian reptile magazine i've done stuff with them um, then reptiles magazine and obviously practical reptile keeping magazine um it's so they've just all come to me i've been pretty lucky like that to be fair and obviously my blog and they see my posts in Facebook in the various groups. Um, some of them get a bit of attention because <laughs> I don't yeah. hold back on anything you see. I just say what I see. Um, yeah, I think it's, I've been pretty lucky, my friend, to be honest. I can't, I can't knock it. I've had some good friends as well, like John Courtney Smith. He's uh, helped me out a lot with uh, various things. I've been pretty lucky. Yeah, no, you definitely have a, a ton of work. You've, you've written a lot. Is there any articles that come to mind that caused the most controversy or stir when you wrote them uh, one of the most popular ones is the the one i've done about water and bearded dragons um basically going through busting the myth of uh hydrating through the vent area and all that sort of stuff because uh, there's been studies done from back in the 1980s that busted that myth but people still honestly just still think that they hydrate through their ass <laughs> it's just absolute nonsense um i'm not in the bearded yeah, dragon world at all and i've actually never heard that so is that is that the the implica- or is that why the, the impetus for people to soak their bearded dragons once a week i don't they think know i don't know where this is coming from honestly it's just people <laughs> it seems to be the problem solver for everything oh, my dragon my dragon shedding i'll stick it in the bath um yeah. my dragon's dehydrated i'll stick it in the bath but it's just for everything it's just stick it in the bath and all it does is stress the animal out most of the time. And it's not going to help when they're shedding because they've got like 100% keratin and waterproof skin. So that's not going to do a thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and they do not hydrate through the, their uh, vent area, which has also been busted by uh, what's it, uh, the Beardy Vet. He's got a YouTube video right. where he's actually done it in surgery and stuff like that, and he's completely busted it. So hopefully someone will believe a vet rather than just me. Yeah. Um, but I did provide all the um, research notes from like Dr. Wade Sherbrooke, I think his name was, who'd done it back in the 80s. He busted it. Um, yeah, it's just that caused a lot of issues, and it still does. I've, I wonder where that came from. Like, what, what other example on the planet do we have where there's a hydration through enema? <laughs> I, don't, I mean, I, I know frogs and stuff do it, but it's completely different. So maybe yeah. it's just some vet. I don't know. I couldn't even begin to where it's come from. Some vet has said, yeah, I mean, they'll take water in through their vent. I don't know. I don't I honestly don't know. It hurts my head <laughs> trying to think yeah. about it. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> so one of the, one of the, you've done a lot of work on UVB that I think is really interesting and you've done some interesting testing so i'd love to jump into some of the tests that you i think you've recently done in terms of you know yeah. scanning different bulbs and 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 also i didn't i know that i actually listened to your your interview with bill strand on on chameleon academy i guess yeah. it's called now and just yep. the concept of not using vitamin d or synthetic vitamin d i actually didn't realize that was somewhat of a controversial move because i've done that as well uh, with with a few, with my Excellent. animals but at that point i guess when you were starting to do this synthetic vitamin d is still something that people really think that you need to supplement so let, let's rewind let's let's go back to just starting with the testing the uvb bulbs maybe you could just quickly uh talk about that article that you wrote yeah i mean basically what i did i got three or was it four for this last one i can't remember might have been four of the top brands um and just i've had them working in various setups for 13 months and i took readings uh weekly 
for each bulb and basically summarized it all up to their deterioration and stuff over the 13 months. Um, I mean, it's a, obviously a lengthy process and it's quite boring writing it all down, but I don't give everybody the whole information. I summarize it all for them. So it's simple. I like to try and keep things simple so people understand it, especially with UVB. People mm-hmm. get so confused. Yeah. Um, so were you yeah. taking readings kind of every month and just slowly watching it deteriorate or was, how every are you doing week that? I was doing well, readings week. for each bulb. Yeah. And uh, uh, I, I forget, I, they, they do deteriorate quite I shouldn't say quite quickly, but over the year, there's a, there's definitely a significant difference between at the beginning and at the end. You can definitely tell like the cheaper bulbs as well. Um, obviously, the phosphorus that they use inside the bulbs is uh, lower grade or even the glass. I'm not 100% sure which part of it is um, substandard compared to the other bulbs. But yeah, there is a, a huge difference. Uh, I'd definitely stick to the Arcadia and, and the Zoomed as well. Yeah, both of those bulbs kind of exactly they, they yeah. maintained the best. Yeah, 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 one hundred percent. But still, after a year, they do need to be changed. Or after yeah, thirteen months, yeah. it's time to change them. I I would change them uh, when it they they do recommend the twelve months thing, and I, I would stick to that. That's uh, definitely a thing to go by. I mean, I usually write my renew date with a sharpie on the actual tube, mm-hmm. so, so I don't forget. But yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is why I want to. I need to get a solar meter so I can start scanning these things myself. So you at least have an idea of of yeah. where they are. Because I mean, maybe it only lasts ten months or something, and then you're kind of short for two months. And exactly. So that, I mean, I've used. I've got a bulb which is an Arcadia one. It's about two years old, and I'm using it using it in a leopard gecko setup now because obviously the UV has diminished to mm-hmm. something that is suitable for them. So it's you save a lot of money once you get your solar meter. <laughs> yes, exactly. And that's, I've never thrown out any of my bulbs because I, I know that one day I'm just going to come <laughs> yeah. back to them and scan them all and, and then see where they are. Cause like, yeah. you can definitely use them on the sort of corpuscular species yeah, and whatnot. Exactly. And, and you, you actually did a really cool demo, I think on your YouTube channel, just showing the difference between under uh, a screen and, and a, without a screen, yeah. which is, it's pretty dramatic. It's uh, literally a 30 second video. I just done it as an extreme example. Yeah. I put the solar meter right underneath the mesh and I had the, uh, the UV hanging over the mesh and under the mesh and I took the readings and showed it and it is it's literally half it and that was the standard like zoomed mesh um like on their chameleon enclosures and stuff like that. obviously mesh uh, you know the holes are bigger on some mesh so you're going to get different readings but that that was a good uh, little indication for people they yeah, don't no. get it some people don't get it they just honestly don't understand why that's happening yeah, well, there's a, a lot of light being blocked out by these little fibers. So <laughs> exactly. that's what happened. Yeah. And in the UK, you guys have like sort of behind you the wooden vivs. Th- those yeah. are way more com- uh, common there. They're n- they're not very common here. And so you don't really deal with the mesh as as much as we probably deal with the mesh. No, um, only for my chameleons really. And well, I have got some of the um, the Zoomed glass terrariums. So I've got some of those, and that has mesh on. Um, so yeah, for the species like a bearded dragon and the snakes, I keep in the wood. Um, yeah, no issues with mesh with those. So yeah, it, it, it is a pain to sort out, especially when someone doesn't quite understand the concept of the UVB. Trying to explain it to people is it, hard work. Yeah, exactly. You put one of those compact UV, like those little you know curly Q bulbs, on top of a yeah. mesh, and you you sort of just wasted your money it's there. Next to nothing. Yeah, next to yeah. nothing. I mean, but obviously people are getting these glass tanks in the States and uh, they're having a T5 on top of it and a bearded dragon inside. They still think that that T5 is strong enough for the bearded dragon's needs. But I mean, I never recommend that unless you've got a solar meter. I mean, I would always say your UV has to be inside. If you haven't got enough room for that T5, then you get a T8 and use it inside the setup um if if you haven't got the height for the t5 to be in the setup yeah you, you can't it's too much guesswork involved otherwise if you're running it over the mesh so. yeah and, and the thing with the bearded dragon and most they're not going to tamper with the lights like a snake might like with i have the arcadia exactly. cages to sort of block my my shade dwellers so they don't yeah, mess with them I've got that and, and as well, yeah yeah, those are pretty good because they don't block out. I think it's only fifteen or twenty percent, which is which yeah, is good. Yeah, it's minimal. Yeah. Yeah, but if you if you can get it right inside, that's obviously much better. I was just looking. I've only actually got it on the uh, corn snake at the bottom because she oh, was yeah. the only one that used to tamper yeah. with the UV. Uh, the the rainbow boa never went up there. Still doesn't go up there, so I've not bothered. So 
Yeah, I would be surprised if my rainbow boa went up there, but my my boas, my my boa imperators, they would definitely will just destroy it because they just tamper with everything. So it's it's good to have. Oh, uh, that's nice. So as far as yeah, your definitely. your move to move away from synthetic vitamin D, so this is an experience that I've had probably in the last six months is something that I've really locked in on. I've talked about it a few times because it is vitamin D hypervitaminosis or hypervitaminosis of vitamin D is a real thing, mm. and it can be dangerous. So tell me about your decision to raise your, your veil chameleon without vitamin D. And I guess at that point was still considered a bit of a controversy, even though that wasn't that long ago. Uh, I think it was about four or five years ago when um, Arcadia, I was asked to help uh, trial the Arcadia Earth Pro A supplement. Um, so I was doing that, obviously, for a few months before its actual release. Uh, and that's when I decided just to ditch all D3 and all the pre-vitamin A stuff um, from all the diets of uh, my reptiles. So I don't use any of it anymore because um, obviously that has got the pro-vitamin A, which is through the carotenoids and stuff like that. So it's got none of that nasty D3. Uh, and the way I thought about it was um, if you're providing the correct lighting and the diet and the hydration and stuff, you don't need like D3. They're quite capable of doing it themselves. So that's, I took a gamble doing it, obviously, but I've had blood tests and whatnot twice a year for the last like four years on my animals and everything's fine. So no reason to change back. Yeah. And that was a cool thing about the way you did it is you actually went through the tests and you took yeah. some blood tests and you realized. So when the animal is exposed to vitamin D, they're collecting their stores of, of vitamin D as well. Sort of like humans, how we are sort yep. of out by the time spring comes and we need to get back outside and start ex- uh, you know, storing more or, you know, synthesizing more. So I think some people think that if if your UV starts to wane and the production reduces, all of a sudden they're going to be immediately low in vitamin D. So you do have a little bit of a buffer zone as, as long as you're keeping up with your dates and your bulbs and replacing them every year. It's okay if it starts to decrease a little bit throughout the year because they still have a store. You're only maybe exactly. starting to eat away at it. Uh, people, I mean, with when it comes to the vitamin D, people instantly think of MBD, don't they? Mm-hmm. They think as soon yeah. as you cut something like that out, their dragon, their chameleon, whatever, is just going to turn into this uh, MBD-ridden animal. Um, I can see it is a scary thought, 100% scary, um, but it's, it's just not the case if you're providing everything as you should. Um, and obviously diet is a huge thing as well, big varied diet, the supplements, is the main thing and obviously the uv if you've got the correct exposure for the animal then there shouldn't be any reason to have the d3 or the pre-vitamin a in the diet yeah and it just simplifies it 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 is so much easier it can be so confusing otherwise supplements is another thing which is confusing because there's so many different brands they've all got different strengths of stuff and and people don't really understand like how dangerous it can be to overdose like on the uh the pro vitamin a and all that sort of stuff it is very dangerous yeah it totally is dangerous and and we think vitamins are healthy so you can't really overdose on them exactly. but vi- uh, vitamin d hypervitaminosis is definitely a, a serious thing and it, it yeah. for sure happens i was someone who was messaged me or messaging me the other day and they lost a, a new chameleon due to that because they uh, weren't uh, totally sure how to do the supplementation and yeah, it's very easy to, to, to mess that up. And the animals are, are made to use <coughs> UV as a, you know, a, to control their vitamin D level. So it yeah. becomes much easier. Um, as far as supplementation, are you just using the Earth Pro A? Uh, I use the Earth Pro A and I'll use the Arcadia Calcium Magnesium supplement. Uh, I think it's like every seventh feed, which works out to a couple of times a month, really. Um, yeah uh yeah and that's it uh, that's literally all i do yeah very simple as far as the earth pro or, or earth pro a i have it as well and for those who aren't familiar with it it's maybe you could just quickly kind of give a little rundown of, of what it is um yeah it's just um it's literally just a calcium based multivitamin um because it provides b complex vitamins through the bee pollen that's in there and the carotenoids provide the vitamin A. So that's a natural source rather than like uh, the pre-vitamin A, which is not. Mm. Um, Yeah, it's a fantastic supplement to use. And then you can use that daily uh, as your go-to supplement uh, without any issues of overdosing. Yeah, it's, 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 I kind of think of it as the, 
the dirt and the things that the animals in the wild would just consume yep. by virtue of you know attacking an insect on the yep. ground and, and inhaling some some minerals that way exactly and I mean, the bee pollen obviously adding the bee complex vitamins is a is a great thing although i mean people do use bee pollen a not a lot now in the hobby but it has been uh, linked to high yeast infections in uh, like bearded dragons and stuff people using it too much on the salads and stuff like that so oh, really? i've not had it 100 percent confirmed but just through my research so far has been linked to yeast. I mean, high yeast is not a problem, really. It's not a major thing. It can be soon sorted out with a probiotic. Um, but yeah, I mean, stuff like this, the Earth Pro A has just got just the right amounts in there. So you've got no issues with that either. And I find that the, the geckos that I feed it to seem to, uh, they don't mind it at all. They, I don't know if they like it, but because it's hard to tell, but they go after the insects without any issues. There's no, there's no problems there. Yeah, I mean, before the Arcadia stuff, I was using like um, a lot of the Rapashi stuff, which is great supplements as well. I mean, you can get the equivalent there. Um, but yeah, I just stick with the Arcadia stuff now because that's what I'm used to and I rely on the product. I know what they're doing. It, that works for me. So Yeah, exactly. And so as far as your feeder insects go, I know you seem to have a ridiculous amount of feeders that you go through. So I'd like to break that down a little bit because I think people do get stuck on one insect feeder that they use kind of just forever type thing. One, one yeah. article that I read that was was interesting was I didn't even realize people were going this way, but a lot of people were starting to write off crickets as being oh, a good feeder. Mate. So maybe you could start with that and then we'll jump into the other feeders that you use. That winds me up when people say like you need... <laughs> Uh, ditch crickets and use like uh, dubia roaches because they equals four crickets or whatever no it doesn't if you i mean look at any uh the supplement guide things you know the nutritional value things it doesn't equal four crickets at all um you should never re replace one feeder for another you should always just add to the variety yeah. uh, and the way i see it is like you've got brown crickets for example you've got the black crickets you've got banded crickets um, they all vary in nutrition in certain ways. So that counts as variety. That's a different feeder. I mean, the same with uh, dubia roaches, uh, uh, what lobster roaches, uh, discoid roaches, all different. Uh, so you just add to variety rather than taking something away to replace it for your benefit. That's not helping the animals at all being for your benefit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And yeah, it's interesting thinking of the concept of using the different species or different subspecies yeah. of these animals as they are different. They they, they have a different taste. They're going to have different, you know, compound makeup. They have different it's muscle, different, well, different muscles. Different movement as well in the setup. So it's different uh, enrichment as well for the animal. They all move differently. Yeah. Um, visual stimulation as well. It's all different. You, you can't be restricting yourself just to one or two items. You're never going to have a healthy animal just by using just one or two feeders yeah exactly so as far as i think i heard you say you have like 20 plus once you include all the different species of, of insects so what, what are some of the other yeah the i other mean feeders you use yeah uh i mean some of it is uh seasonal uh i mean you've got silkworms i've got like uh the dendrobina worms i've got lob worms uh the various different crickets there's like uh what have i got uh, banded crickets Black crickets, house crickets, silent crickets, uh, Ethiopian crickets, which I refuse to get any more now, actually, because they're so noisy. They're ridiculous. Um, <laughs> got horsehead crickets, uh, several different roaches. Like I said, it's all different variety, different worms. Um, I use uh, mantis as well, uh, stick insects. Uh, what else have I got? Yeah, and I also do wild caught stuff in the summer as well. I'll catch things. I've got like a, a Zoomed Zapper, I think it's called, or Napper. I don't know if they make them anymore, but I hang it outside and I'll get moths flying to it and all sorts. And uh, I feed them off because, again, I've been doing that for 30 odd years. That was the only way to get variety back in the day. Yeah, you needed um, to catch I've your own. Any yep, never had any related issues so all that stuff about wild insects cause parasites nothing related to that at all but if you think about it all these wild insects have got a huge palette to feed from rather than just like a, a little storage box where they're more likely to pick up them in parasites and stuff yeah um, no totally yeah so as far as your insect do you do you, are you 
keeping a lot of these at once or do you, you just go to the store and buy a variety and then kind of gut load them? I breed like locusts and a few crickets and stuff and a few worms and I'll do swaps with other friends that breed their stuff. So I do a lot of swaps. Um, but yeah, I get some from the store, but most of the stuff is just my own stuff. Mm. And then as far as gut loading, what are you doing there? Um, I did a study on gut loading as well, actually, which was published in a couple of years back in Practical Reptile Keeping magazine. Um, I was taking one cricket, one locust, one roach, um, and gut loading for 24 hours. And I literally watched them to see when they pooped. So I knew when they were digesting the food. So I've got basically the optimal gut load times for these animals and stuff like I think the locust was like a few three or four hours roach was 12 hours I can't remember off the top of my head what it was but the crickets were one of the fastest ones uh, but basically the easiest way to do it is fresh vegetables and greens uh, separate the ones that you're going to be feeding off the following day and just gut load those uh, concentrate you know on a high good diet for those um, bugs and you can leave the breeding ones to whatever you feed them. Um, at least then you know the ones that you've separated are gut loaded. Because uh, if you're picking them out like out of a tub with thousands in there, you don't know which ones have eaten and stuff like that. So I just find that way is easier for me. Yeah, exactly. That's actually what I do as well. And I only started doing that maybe a few months ago because it kind of dawned on me as well. Like, why am I just pulling out of this main? You can't tell what's what. Exactly. And so yeah, you just put them in a separate container and let them munch away and then they're good to go. It's, it's far easier. So then as far as you feed, when you feed them off to your animals, you're dusting them. And then are you just letting them go into the, into the enclosures and letting the animals yeah, hunt I them? I let a few at a time. I don't like chuck like 20 bugs in there. I mean, like, for example, my bearded dragon gets probably several large size bugs two or three times a week. Um, the chameleon gets probably four or five bugs maybe twice a week it's just i mean that's a huge problem as well people overfeeding their animals it's just such a huge mm-hmm. issue that i've been battling with another article that i did about obesity um yeah i mean so i just do it a few at a time i don't chuck them all in there because you will they ain't gonna better find like five or six crickets all in like a few seconds i just do it a few at a time and let them hunt yeah, it, and that's it's it's. I think it's really important to let them hunt, and it's fun to let them hunt. Yeah. And and you know, once exactly. in a while, one will you know a cricket will find its way down to the bottom and and yeah. you know, stay safe for the night. But then the next morning, <laughs> the, the gecko will get it. And yeah, I love it that. will soon come up. If you when they soon they get attracted to the heat, the crickets and the roaches, so they'll go up there. And then oh, your lights are just turned on in the background. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's morning now. <laughs> oh, is it? What time is it there then? It's eight forty six now. Oh wow, I got you up. Oh no, I'm always up. I'm all, uh, yeah, no, I wake up early. I'm a morning person. Ah, uh, nice, nice. Yeah. Um anyway, yeah. Um yeah, they get attracted to the heat, so they'll soon they'll be gone as the following morning. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then and do you and you were saying you feed uh, a couple of worms and and sort of caterpillars and whatnot. Do you feed any superworms or mealworms or do you stay away from those? Uh, I do feel uh I feed them as part of a varied diet, but obviously people have it in the head about the superworms being like a staple food, but I hate that word. Um, I'd rather that word at all. I just, variety is key, but superworms are so fatty. Um, and people, if you're feeding say 10, 12 of these a day, that's a lot of fat for an animal to take. Um, yeah. Yeah. But and, I still and- feed them and mealworms as well. I mean, a little bit of roughage in the diet helps clear the digestive tract. So it's, it's all good. Yeah, it's those two have a bunch of myths kind of surrounding them as well. Like they, they first they were sort of banned, like don't feed them because the superworm's yeah. going to eat its way out of the gecko oh, stomach, yeah. and then mealworms were bad. And yeah, I think as long as they're feeding in moderation and they're mix, you're mixing them up, and once in a while exactly. you go for those. I think it's totally fine. I mean, a lot of things like um, the calcium worms. I don't know what you call them there. Are they called calcium worms there? They got all sorts of names, don't they? Yeah, we have a brand called Phoenix Worms. Black, yeah, and black. Black soldier fly larvae, back basically. Um, yeah. I feed them. I yeah. stick them in a like a little bowl thing because they're too small. I, I find like the animals aren't really interested in them apart from maybe the geckos, um, but the bigger animals aren't interested in them unless there's a bunch of them wriggling around together. So I do feed them like in a bowl. Um, but apart from that, that's it. 
Yeah, I do the same thing with those because yeah, they, and they they as soon if they hit the substrate, like they're gone, they're gonna dig yeah, themselves exactly. down, and you'll never. Well, you'll see them again in a couple months when they turn. But the into animal a fly. probably won't see them. So, yeah, yeah. Once in a while, I'll it, once they've gone into their, their sort of pupate when they're little black hard things, yeah. I'll just chuck them into my geckos enclosures. So then eventually they'll turn into they're flies. Flying. And yeah, yeah, they're pretty. They're pretty rubbish at flying, so that they, they yeah. soon get eaten up, don't they? They're terrible at flying. They just <laughs> hammer themselves into the ceiling. <laughs> 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 hoping to escape uh, yeah no chance as far as your snakes go do you do you do a variety for food as well yeah i do um obviously i've got the rats uh i still do mice i've got hamster uh gerbil uh, gerbils i do chicks um i do quail um what else i've done frog's legs as well um i think what else yeah, I, do, I mean, there's five or six different things that I do rotate with. Again, variety as well. I try, I mean, we all know that a snake can live for 20, 30 years just on rats, but give them the variety. It's available to you. Yeah, you can do it. Exactly, yeah. And we, we do often in the snake world think that if you go with variety, you're going to get a snake that refuses food for the rest of its life. And, you no, know. no, no. Yeah, it's not true. You've got a less chance of them um, refusing food, actually, if you use variety, because obviously they don't get the taste for the same thing all the time. So Yeah. Um, I mean, incidentally, I do dust a little bit of supplements on the um, snake stuff every now and then as well, a little bit of the earth away or whatever. Oh, interesting. Not I all shouldn't... the time. Yeah. So. Just for a little bit? Yeah, yeah. Just every, every now and then I'll dust them. So. So as far as your Royal Python goes, are you, you're doing a variety of, of food as well and you have no issues yep. feeding? No issues whatsoever. He gets uh, fed less than the rest of the snakes because he he doesn't really do much uh, like most uh, Royal Pythons. They'll just, he comes out, he basks in the morning uh, and then you might not see him for the rest of the day until like the following day. But And whilst my other snakes are fairly active, um, the corn snake and the hog nose probably are the most active. The hog nose doesn't stop. He's in and out the substrate, up and down. He's all over the place. Um, but yeah, um, I've never had any issues with his feeding either because he's like, uh, you kind of just have to leave the stuff in there for them. They don't strike, do they? So uh, they kind of drop feed. Right. Yeah, and I, it is one of those, I, I often think that snakes, having issues with snakes feeding, to me, a lot of the time is a snake being overfed like yeah. it, it doesn't want more food and you're like hey well it's the second friday like every friday i'm supposed to feed you and you're not eating again but i mean i've said many times these things can go a long time so what, like for 100. your your royal your, your for your ball python how how often are you feeding him um i mean i can go like once a month um that is probably the average to be fair i can usually tell when they want food all my snakes they usually you can tell they're out and about and they're scouting around um most of the time i do get before that happens but you know they're hungry when when that's happening so that's that's just a good way of going about it but if not then uh obviously again research the snake the, the large-bodied snakes like the pythons you don't need to be feeding every week at a certain age um say after probably a year and a half they can you can reduce it right down once they're in the, the big size setups yeah exactly uh, so and actually, I read your article that you that was in uh, Practical Reptile Keeping. Uh, I think it was maybe published two or three days ago. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. One, yeah, yeah, and it was just regarding ball python setup. So maybe we could just quickly chat about that because it, yeah. it of course, is one of the probably the most controversial topics in the reptile hobby, just because of the popularity of ball pythons yeah, and yeah. the popularity of keeping them in racks. So. And I think in the article is interesting because you talk about keeping them in a smaller kind of tub-like system when they're younger to yeah. establish them, which is what, what I have done as well with my carpet yeah. python and, and how important that is. And So maybe you could start with that setup and then tell us what he's in now. I mean, yeah, that's the only time I'd use one of those small setups uh, um, with a heat mat. I don't use heat mats like for anything unless it's like a hatchling or, or a growing reptile. I mean, under six months maybe for a snake. Um, so yeah, I'll keep them in that little, like uh, whatever they're called, like a breeding box. Um, I'll keep them in there with the heat mat until about six months old. And then I've got no issues of putting them straight into a five foot setup, which my Royal Python's in now, five foot by, I think it's two and a half foot by two foot, I think. Um, and he'll use every bit of it when he's basking, especially he'll stretch right out. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, he hides during the day behind the logs and in his hides and stuff. But that's just what they do. It doesn't mean that you restrict them to just having that, like in a little tub. They don't do it all the time. They've got no choice yeah in the tub just to sit you know but to sit there so give them options let them choose exactly and you know it's an interesting point you make in the article is that i i can't remember your exact words but essentially a lot of it seems like people forget that they do grow fairly large like a female yeah. is going to get to the five foot mark and yeah. a, the, the male is going to be around the four feet or maybe a little more and i think because the morph market is so advanced at this point people love we, everybody's just obsessed with baby ball pythons and that's it like we cut the egg we take the picture that's exciting <laughs> yeah, and yeah. then the morph kind of slowly fades like metaphorically and physically because the, yep. as the snake grows the, the morph does fade you don't yep. see pictures of adult snakes with a morph no. because it doesn't look as brilliant as they do when they come out of the egg it's the same with many species i mean like again bearded dragons their color changes most of the time drastically from the the rapid naught to six months growth which is the rapid stage of growth and then you've got the six to twelve months which is what i'd say would be a juvenile uh the color changes and then 12 months onwards it's virtually unrecognizable most of the time um it's the same in and everybody like you said wants the babies whether it's a baby dragon they all look cute cute is the thing isn't it yeah. um but obviously that can be detrimental for the poor animal because they forget they just want this cute baby buying all these mega young uh, animals that are way too young to be sold most of the time. Um, issues after issues you'll have. Yeah, it's it's very it is very bizarre, especially you know they're too young to be sold, and then often they're too young to be bred. They, they you know you you feed them up so you can breed them, and and yeah, it becomes this revolving market of selling babies with no focus yeah. on the adult animal, and it's 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 so yeah. strange. It be, the adults just become breeders to feed the market for the babies, and it becomes a vicious negative sort of feedback loop i mean i'll touch again on the bearded dragons being sold uh, too young that is a huge problem still um and a lot of these chain stores is the main thing breeders should know better to be fair i mean i've never sold any of my dragons under three months probably three months four months is when i've moved them on um because you find you only have to look on my group uh bearded dragons network at people having issues with their little tiny dragon that's about three inches long. Um, it's not eating, it's not moving. Uh, all these issues stem from it being moved on to early because you find that when they're kept together with their clutch mates of about four or five different clutch mates, that kind of kick starts their survival instinct. They eat because they want to eat before the other dragons eat and they bask because they want to eat before the other dragons bask. And if you move them away from that, they've got nothing to, uh, I mean, like in the wild, they'd be in a wild situation. That's different. They'd, uh, the instincts would have to kick in, but in captivity, although the wild instincts are present, sometimes need that stimulation to kick it in like, like the other dragons eating. So they'll eat. It's a competition. For yeah. Basking for heat, for food. And then you remove them from that and it all goes out the window and they, you end up getting a dragon, which is so small, it doesn't eat, it doesn't bask. Uh, and ultimately, most of the time, it will end up passing away. It's the same for most species. Yeah. So is that, is that more, that's a result of those sort of large industrialized, you know, massive breeders that are just selling off animals to, to the box stores, you think? Um, I mean, a lot of the stores, they'll lie to these, customers and or they just generally don't know the age of the dragon basically right um because these chain stores obviously you've got employees working there they're not necessarily uh know what they're talking about they're just there to sell goods um so it's not their fault really um they're just doing their job um but as far as breeders i'd pick a, a good breeder and try and stick with them any good breeder shouldn't be selling animals like underage it's the same for any species yeah. Well, no, no, yeah. No breeder wants that reputation of having animals no. that go home and, and die. And, and that, that is an interesting concept of, of that social enrichment that, yeah. that some of these animals need. Bearded dragons are somewhat of a social reptile in a lot yeah. of ways. And, and even in the wild, I'm sure clutch mate com competitiveness is, is what sparks their, their eagerness to go out and, yeah, and yeah. behave like wild animals. Probably. I mean, I keep them in when I've bred them, I've bred hundreds over the years. I mean, I've, 
kept them in groups of like five or six um, in separate enclosures. And I've never had any issues with fighting or, um, well, certainly not over the last probably 10, 15 years. I've not since I've like honed in the techniques basically by observing before. I had issues before, sure I did. Um, but it's just stuff you kind of learn. And uh, yeah, I've witnessed uh, these animals, the competition for food, like we said, and the competition for the basking spots and the UV spot. It just kicks starts that survival instinct which they've always had but they're missing because of the lack of wild situations so yeah and then the amount of stress to just yank them out of that environment and put them into a new you know into the pet store loud and bright and then go home to another it's like of course it's going to die stress is a huge problem as well in the um, reptile buying world i mean they're taking these little animals away and that's an instant stress putting it in a new enclosure and they don't realize how bad Stress for any species is bad, as we know, even for humans. Uh, so, uh, obviously, the older they are, the more confident they are. Uh, it's just so many issues, my friend. You, I mean, you'll see on my group, I see you joined it today, I think, didn't you? You'll see in there, there's so many young dragons, I think. Um, you'll see, it's, it's, it's terrible. We just offer the advice we can, and it's, but it's the same for chameleons as well. I mean, they need that social interaction at the beginning just to kickstart everything yeah yeah those yeah exactly there's it's it's yeah it's, it's a very strange world so it's it's good that there are people out there like yourself who are, are starting to tackle these myths and and helping people point them in the right direction because really that's what we need and i think the yeah. internet can be a hugely positive tool and facebook can be as well like you said at the beginning it's a double-edged sword so if yeah, we're not yeah. constantly staying up to date and, and doing our best to not play the insult game but just provide the information yeah it should slowly improve over time yeah um yeah i mean that's all we can do is provide the information um whether people want to read it and take it in it's up to them but our bit is done if we're providing it and people like yourself helping it in the video form and the podcast form um people have got no excuse really yeah, exactly. So as far as yourself, in terms of uh, future plans and, and projects and whatnot, do you have anything on the go uh, reptile-wise or, or just online-wise that you're working on or just kind of keep uh, plugging away at what you're currently doing? Yeah, I'll just keep plugging away. I'll do really the odd YouTube video and stuff, but it's uh, nothing nothing major like you guys. Um, um, I don't mind doing these podcasts. That's pretty cool. It's all That's kind of new to me still, um, yeah. but it's been, it's been good. Um, what else? Uh, just I've just got the future projects which have already been confirmed. But I can't really say anything about. Um, yeah, so you'll see a lot more still of me doing my articles and stuff on the blog, and which I always plug my articles anyway on there and in my groups. Uh, yeah. Yeah, like I said at the beginning, you're you're everywhere and nowhere at the same time. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like you're all when 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 you start looking for Pete Hawkins, you, you just pop up all over the place. I'm like, oh, people are saying your name all the time, but it, it's it's interesting. You. you you have tons of work out there. So that, that is awesome. Can you tell everybody where they can find uh, you online in terms of your website and, and Instagram and whatnot? Uh, yeah, I've got a little blog, which is uh, reptilenetworks.co.uk. And on there will be my own thoughts and nonsense if people want to read it, but also links to my various articles that I do with Exotic Direct. Uh, that's uh, like an insurance blog. Um, they're an insurance company they insure like exotic animals here i do a blog for them also my blog for northampton reptile center links to those but also links to the pdf files from practical reptile keeping magazine which i'm allowed to share once that edition's over and done with if you know what i mean um i can share on there they're down, you can download those for free they're various subjects um and obviously my Facebook groups, I think we mentioned them all earlier, all the network groups. Um, that's about it. YouTube channel, I haven't got a clue what that's called. Uh, <laughs> but I've got a few things on, on there, but nothing major. And my Instagram's all linked on the reptilenetworks.co.uk site anyway. So. Awesome. Well, I'll make sure everything's in the show notes, of course. And I, I do recommend people go check out your Instagram for sure. Just to, of course, read your work as well. But the Instagram, just to see the pictures of, of the enclosures because they, they are amazing. They're awesome. And they uh, definitely a good standard to look up to. So, Pete, thank you very much for, for joining me today. This was an absolute, absolute pleasure. Absolute pleasure, my friend. Yeah, I loved it. 
All right, that brings us to the end of another episode. Pete, thank you very much for joining me. That was a great conversation. I appreciated the hour you spent with me, but I've also appreciated the fact that we've been able to stay in touch and message back and forth since then. So that was fantastic. And I actually have taken Pete's advice. We were talking about the wild caught insects in the episode, and I did do that last week. I managed to catch two moths outside and I threw them into my day gecko's enclosure and she gobbled them up right away. And I know that wild caught insects is one of those touchy points in the reptile trade. Many people are afraid to use them. And Pete actually just wrote a fantastic article about using wild caught insects and why the parasite and pesticide fear that we all have is somewhat unfounded although there is i mean you still have to be careful but i'll I'll direct you to his website reptilenetworks.co.uk of course that will be in the show notes as well and you can find that article and read it there i am very excited about the prospect of using wild caught insects for one if you establish decent enough traps you could actually pay for your insects for the summer depending on how many animals you have plus we know as we said in the podcast wild insects have this giant array of diet that they consume out in the wild and that can be incredibly healthy for our animals and not to mention the fact that we do know insects synthesize vitamin d as well so they use the uv and it makes them more healthy and robust and you are giving your animal different types of insects meaning they're gonna have to learn how to hunt and attack different types of bugs which again is another level of enrichment so i'm gonna definitely focus on this a lot more throughout the summer it's something i'm super interested in and maybe if you're brave enough you will try it as well but again i'll point you to pete's article so you can give it a read and it might make you feel a little bit more comfortable about the whole thing Again, for any more information on the podcast, make sure you go to animalsathomenetwork.com and you'll also find a link to Bryce Broom's new podcast on the Animals at Home Network called Animals Everywhere. That's also in the header. You can check out his podcast. He now has two episodes that have been released. Both have been absolutely fantastic. And if you are interested in supporting the Animals at Home Network, you can always go to the Apple Podcasting app and leave a rating and or review. That really does help with our visibility in the Apple Podcasting app. So if you do that, that would be wonderful. And again, thank you very much to our sponsor, CustomReptileHabitats.com. If you are in the need of any gold standard reptile equipment, definitely check them out. If you do purchase something from one of the links in either the show notes or the YouTube description, a small commission does come back to me at no extra cost to you, which of course does in turn help support the show. All right, next week, Bryce will have his third episode of Animals Everywhere up. And then the next episode of the Animals at Home podcast will be the week after that. Until then, I will talk to you guys later.